Dive into God's Word. Dig a little deeper. Discover the Bible's message for you today. Pathway to Paradise Ministries presents Deeper, your daily Bible study with Dr. Tim Rumsey and Pastor David Salazar. Well, good morning, and thank you for joining us today. You are listening to Deeper, your daily Bible study. This is Wednesday, February 27, and we are looking at the lesson titled The Image of the Beast. A reminder that you can find a lot of additional resources and study notes and teacher helps online at pathwaytoparadise.org. Just follow the links for Deeper, and uh, we hope that you will avail yourself of those resources. My name is Tim Rumsey, and joining me is Pastor David Salazar. We look forward to studying with you today. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, you have given us the Bible for many, many reasons. You've given us Bible prophecy for many reasons as well. Among those is that we may believe and that we may understand your warnings for us today. So as we study these important topics today, we ask that you would help us to understand your message to us and take it to heart. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, David, this is part two of our study of the beast from the earth. And uh, let's dive in here. We're looking at the image to the beast. Would you read for us Revelation chapter 13 and verse number 14? Certainly, Tim. It says, And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast which had a wound by a sword and did live. Okay, so uh, we mentioned yesterday that a change comes over this uh, power, which we saw very clearly is pointing to the United States. It starts out professing Christianity. It has two horns like a lamb. But then verse 11 predicts a point comes in time where it will speak as a dragon. And that change from the lamb to the dragon uh, occurs as verse 14 is fulfilled, as this image to the beast is formed. Now, David, uh, let's just do a real quick review of history. Back in the uh, Middle Ages, right? what was it that uh, defined this, this beast power? That would be the beast from the sea, and we looked at that a few days ago. What combination of uh, elements was it that united together to form this beast power? Well, you had, of course, the, first of all, the uh, theory, the concepts of religion, of Christianity with paganism connected together. And it brought uh, the sun worship uh, in, a, in a connection to the Sunday worship as a day of, of rest, as a day of worship to God. So they bring, we brought that, they changed even, they, they appear to change times and laws as the Bible speaks of. They blaspheme against God. They brought these, these false uh, system of, of, of worship uh, to the people. And then they persecuted them, those that did not obey, did not follow the, the, the leadership of the time or the, or the church of that time or the worship of that time. So they had the power to persecute, to, to confiscate, to destroy and to take those that will not follow by force or by concept or, be, or, or personal choice, the, the, the Roman Catholic Church. So it is, uh, you know, that's kind of what in essence, and again, it was the pagan system of worship that was adopted in Christianity, that mixing of both, that brought a uh, Sunday worship as, as a day of rest. That's right. So it was really a combination of several things that you would not expect to find together. As you said, paganism, especially sun worship, uh, elements of Christianity as well. And then, of course, the other side of all of that is the political power. All this unites together. Mm-hmm. That was the original beast. And it was really the Sunday laws of Constantine and then in the decades that followed in the Council of Laodicea. Uh, let me back up. Constantine legalized Christianity, and then he uh, made a law in 321 AD to protect Sunday. Uh, several decades later, I believe it was um, 364 AD. I may be wrong on that, but it was a few decades later, still in that century, the Council of Laodicea went further than Constantine. Mm -hmm. And they actually outlawed worship on the seventh day. And so these worship laws became more and more harsh as the papal power was developing uh, there in the Roman Empire. Fascinating quote from A.T. Jones in the book, Great Empires of Prophecy. He, He writes this on page 491. 
In Constantine's Sunday Law, power was given to the church to compel those who did not belong to the church and who were not subject to the jurisdiction of the church to obey the commands of the church. In the Sunday Law, there was given to the church control of the civil power so that by it she could compel those who did not belong to the church to act as though they did. The history of Constantine's time may be searched through and through, and it will be found that in nothing did he give to the church any such power except in this one thing, the Sunday law, end quote. So it's a matter of historical record that it was the, the, the mechanism above all else that gave the papacy power during the Middle Ages was the implementation of the Sunday laws and the enforcement of Sunday worship. And David, as you mentioned here, the penalties for not complying with these worship laws were very harsh, uh, even going to death at many times and circumstances. That was the original beast, which ruled for over a thousand years, 1,260 years. Now, the Bible again, Revelation 13 says that this uh, beast from the earth, the United States, even though it begins its existence looking like a lamb, so professing Christianity, and we saw that those two horns that it has represent civil and religious freedom, a time will come when it speaks as a dragon and that it will actually work with this uh, beast from the sea, which we saw represents the papacy. Now, how in the world can that happen? We live in the land of the free and uh, we look at what America has been, what it was established as, and we wonder how in the world could such a change take place. I want to read a couple of other quotes for you. This first one is from John Adams. He was writing to Thomas Jefferson uh, back in 1821, and he was very clear and direct. Uh, this is a very blunt statement, but this is what John Adams had to say. He said, quote, I have long been decided in opinion that a free government and the Roman Catholic religion can never exist together in any nation or country, end quote. And then in another letter um, mm -hmm. to uh, his wife, he wrote this, liberty and popery cannot live together. Wow. Now, again, those, those are strong statements, aren't they? But they had, and, uh, they had a lot of uh, insight. I mean, that's why they had, they had, he has seen through history the, the, you know, the persecuting power, the oppression that it comes from a, government connecting and having religious, uh, you know, power connected. Even if it was a, a the good system, even if it was a good religion, it was never, uh, it will never, it will never succeed in giving people freedom of conscience. And so that is why, That's you know, right. he was so clearly against papacy. And we should note, uh, as we talk about these things, we are certainly not talking about individual members who of the church who are Roman Catholics. We're not talking about people. We're talking about a system. And uh, my guess would be that that was probably the spirit in which John Adams was writing as well. He was talking really about a political system Correct. that exercised spiritual or religious control. Now, he was not alone in this opinion. Uh, Marquis de Lafayette, who of course was the French general that uh, helped the United States gain its independence, he wrote this, quote, it is my opinion that if the liberties of this country, the United States of America, are destroyed, it will be by the subtlety of the Roman Catholic Jesuit priests, for they are the most crafty, dangerous enemies to civil and religious liberty. Mm. They have instigated most of the wars in Europe. And he would know because he had fought uh, in a number of wars in Europe, most notably the French Revolution. Wow. Um, which we studied a couple weeks ago. Right. Let me share one more statement. This is from Abraham Lincoln, and he said this, quote, I do not pretend to be a prophet, but though not a prophet, I see a very dark cloud on our horizon, and that dark cloud is coming from Rome. Mm. It is filled with tears of blood. It will rise and increase till its flanks will be torn by a flash of lightning, followed by a fearful peal of thunder. Then a cyclone such as the world has never seen will pass over this country, spreading ruin and desolation from north to south. Neither I nor you, but our children will see those things, end quote. That's from Abraham Lincoln. Wow. And by the way, if you'd like to know the references for those, go online. They're in our study notes. All of this is documented. Now, why are we reading these statements? Because we need to remember what the founders of our country knew from personal experience. As you said, David, they recognized the danger of combining uh, religious 
and and uh, civil power together, and they were fearful that the liberties of the United States would not last forever. Sadly, as soon as you connect and combine both, uh, I mean, a religion with political, you will essentially take away liberty of conscience. That's right. Now, I want to relate some other history to you. In 1888, the United States almost passed a Sunday law. You can find it online. It's very well documented. It's called the Blair Sunday Bill of 1888. Mm -hmm. It did not pass. Uh, it was narrowly defeated. But people were watching what was happening in the United States. And one of those people mm -hmm. uh, was the Pope in Rome. And a few years after 1888, after these things happened, uh, he wrote a letter to one of the newspapers in New York City. Hmm. And he had a very interesting uh, take on what was happening here in America. He wrote this, quote, In Pope Leo's view, the United States has reached the period when it becomes necessary to bring about the fusion of all the heterogeneous elements in one homogeneous and indissoluble nation. Big words, long sentence, but... What he's saying here is that I'm watching what's happening in America and this Sunday bill that almost passed, and the United States, in my opinion, has now reached an important period. And he goes on later to say this, quote, he wants America to be powerful in order that Europe may regain strength from borrowing a rejuvenated type. Hmm. And then finally, later in the letter, he says this, the church, and he's speaking here of the Catholic Church, ought to be the chosen crucible for the molding and absorption of races into one united family. And that especially is the reason why he labors at the codification of ecclesiastical affairs in order that this distant member of Christianity, speaking of the United States, hmm. may infuse new blood into the old organism. Wow. In other words, here's the point. Way back in the 1890s, the papacy recognized that the United States would be its eventual partner and that uh, this was the partner it needed to regain its uh, authority and control over the world. And the Bible calls this union, this alliance, the image to the beast. And it's very interesting and disturbing, frankly, when we look at statements from our most recent presidents here in the United States, compare them to the statements of our founding fathers. Uh, after Pope Francis issued his encyclical on the environment, uh, President Obama referred to the full moral authority of, of the Pope, saying, you know, I am going to endorse and support his moral authority. A few years before that, uh, President Bush, George W. Bush, uh, said that the best way we can honor Pope John Paul II is to put his uh, teachings into practice here in America. So we are seeing a shift, aren't we? Uh, it's It's been happening. We're in the middle of it here. The Bible very clearly mm. points out where this will lead. Eventually, it will lead to the enforcement of the mark of the beast. And uh, we will dive into that subject in the last couple lessons this week here. But uh, David, I don't know about you. I'm thankful that God reveals these things in the Absolutely. Bible so that we can keep our focus on him. Amen. And that's what we need. And it might be well for us at this point to conclude our study by remembering what Jesus said to his disciples in John 14, verse 29. He said, And now I have told you before it comes to pass, that when it is come to pass, you might believe. And we can see very clearly as we look at our world today that we live in the time when so many of these prophecies in Revelation are in the midst of being fulfilled and are almost fulfilled. We have many, many reasons to believe. Well, thank you for joining us today. Uh, we are out of time. I hope that you've been blessed by the time spent in God's Word. And we look forward to studying uh, more deeply with you tomorrow as we continue our study of Revelation. Thank you and God bless. Deeper is a production of Pathway to Paradise Ministries. For more Bible study resources, including books, DVDs, and study guides, visit pathwaytoparadise.org or call toll-free 855-HIS-TRUTH. To support this ministry with your tax-deductible contribution, visit pathwaytoparadise.org or call toll-free 855-HIS-TRUTH. That's 855-447-8788.